Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thanks for coming today. The, uh, the next talk, or the first talk of the day, rather, is uh, going to be a discussion of the different societies on the internet from the uh, perspective of political philosophy. Our speaker is Adam Obeng, and please give him a warm round of applause. Welcome. Thanks, Chris. Um, so as he said, the title of my talk is Tor is Peace, Software Freedom is Slavery, and Wikipedia is Truth. The first question you're going to be asking yourselves is, what on earth is this guy doing at CCC? How, how is this relevant to any of us? Well, I'm going to try to tell you. So as the subtitle says, I'm here to talk about the political philosophy of the internet. What I'm going to attempt to do is analyze, using the tools and ideas of political philosophy, some aspects of some communities of the internet. And I thought that the best way to introduce um, what's a, it's a pretty large area of study, political philosophy, so the best way to introduce it would be to use a specific example. So the title of my talk is actually a little bit dishonest. Um, it sounds like I'm trying to tackle the entirety of political philosophy and the entirety of the internet at the same time, but I've only got an hour to give this talk, so perhaps a more accurate title uh, would be something like this, the political philosophy of some of the internet. And I've just chosen one basic philosophical concept, which is freedom, sorry, uh, and I'm going to apply it to one type of community, so the FLOSS or Free Libre open source software community. But the ideas and methods that I'm going to discuss um, can be used throughout political philosophy and hopefully they'll apply to other communities as well. So I'm going to take a political question that's very important to these communities and I'm going to try to work towards answering this question, drawing on the ideas that previous political philosophers have developed. Um, the answer that I come to might be a little bit controversial, but probably not too much. So philosophers have been studying this, the political realm, for thousands of years. And as I said, they've come up with all sorts of ideas and concepts which they use to analyze the behavior of communities and even to say how they think communities should behave. So I'm going to take these tools, and because they're mostly used for the real world, I'm going to adapt them a little bit so that they can apply to virtual communities as well. Now, there's not that much, um, th there's a bit of a difference, but it's, it's not too bad, and most of the ideas carry over. But before I can do any of that, um, before I can do anything using political philosophy, I'm going to have to sort of say what political philosophy actually is. So political philosophy has the words politics, and philosophy in it. So I'm going to take those one at a time first and say what they mean. So first, politics. Politics is a study of power. Now I've just replaced one word that I had to define by another word that I have to define, which is power. So what's power? Well, if there are any physicists or engineers in the room, I think you'll know what, what you think of power as being. Um, I think I'm right in saying that in physics, power is the rate at which work is performed. In political philosophy, power is a similar thing, except power is the rate at which you can get other people to do work for you. Um, so it's the ability to make other people do things, whether they want to or not. So politics is a study of this ability to make other people do things. And how you acquire this ability and how you can use this ability. Now, while power is a central idea of politics, um, you can apply power in many different contexts. So, of course, you know, part of, part of po politics is what you normally think about, you know, politicians and governments. Part of it is studying what politicians do with power, and part of it is studying governments comparatively and seeing how different countries regulate and distribute and manage the use of power. But politics isn't about government, and politics isn't just about politicians. Politics happens wherever there are transactions of power, so politics does happen in government, but politics also happens in families and in workplaces and in conferences. Politics, in fact, happens wherever there are people. 
wherever people disagree and wherever someone tries to make someone else do something for them. So I've been talking in the abstract so far. I'm going to give you an example of the exercise of political power. And one of the problems with philosophy in general is that we're often talking about very abstract concepts that are far removed from everyday experience. So it's important to give examples so that people can relate to the concepts that we're using. So it's also useful if the examples are drawn from the experience of the people you're talking to. So if I was talking to a, an audience of university students, I'd probably use uh, examples of university politics. And if it was an audience of doctors, I'd probably use examples set in hospitals. But seeing as it's an audience of hackers, I'm going to use an XKCD comic. So I think, I, I'm, sh I'm sure you've all seen this one. Uh, so what's going on here? So the first character requests a sandwich from the second, the second character initially refuses, the first character uh, rephrases the command, and then the second character obeys. So I think, I think you understand what's, what's going on here. Um, so on, on Unix and Unix-like operating systems, there's a particular user, as you all know, the super user who has all rights and privileges over the system. And the use of this uh, sudo command allows you to temporarily become a user, normally to temporarily become the super user, and to carry out a command with all the rights and permissions. And what's the, what the comic is saying, it's making a joke of it, it's saying that in the real world it's not so simple. Um, in the real world there's no magic word that you can just say and then everyone does what you want. Except maybe there is. <laughs> So, but, but in fact, becoming um, the super user, of, uh, as it might be, of a group of real people is actually quite difficult. Becoming the president of the United States is actually quite difficult. Nevertheless, it's interesting to note that um, this idea of power is built into the internet at a fundamental level, at a software level. And it's not surprising that, because it's built in the software level, the communities that are on top of it, built on top of the software level, also use transactions of power. So it's, it's not a coincidence. Um, so that's politics. So next, philosophy. So philosophy is thinking about stuff. That's a little bit vague. Um, it used to be that any sort of thinking about stuff was called philosophy. So the sciences were called natural philosophy, and I'm sure they had other terms for other sorts of thinking. But nowadays, philosophy only really applies to certain sorts of thinking about stuff. Um, it, it, philosophy nowadays is only about thinking about stuff really hard. <laughs> now, why, why is this? Well, if you're at university in the United Kingdom, your first degree will probably be a Bachelor of Sciences or a Bachelor of Arts or something, and then your second degree will be a Master's. But it's only when you're really good at thinking about stuff, when you can think about stuff really hard, that you can become a doctor of philosophy. Um, but still, that's a little bit vague. What does it mean to think about something really hard? Well, in fact, that's what characterizes philosophy. Philosophy is a way of thinking. The way you think is what makes you a philosopher. So to understand this philosophical way of thinking, perhaps it would be useful to compare it to other academic disciplines. Uh, it's another XKCD comic, I'm afraid. Uh, so so uh, what's going on here? So the comic is supposed to have arranged um, different academic fields of study by their so-called purity, by how removed they are from the empiric world, by how pure they are. So sociologists, all the way on this end of the graph, are the least pure of all subjects because sociology is just applied psychology. But psycho psychology in turn is just applied biology and so on, chemistry and physics, and the punchline being that mathematics is the purest of all subjects. Now you'll notice that I'm talking about philosophy and there's no philosophy on this uh, diagram. That's better. So the philosopher who I'd, I've added on at the end, represented by black hat guy, has noted that in fact philosophy is the purest of all subjects it's all the way on the end, and in fact, philosophy is outside of the box that all the other subjects are in. Philosophy is the purest of all subjects, and that's what's important about its way of thinking. In fact, philosophy is critical, rational, and systematic. That's a philosophical way of thinking. So, and that's pretty much all there is to it. If, if you approach your subject in a critical way, and you use rational and systematic arguments, then you're doing philosophy. 
And it's purest because this method of thinking requires the smallest amount of input possible from the real em empirical world. Okay, so we've done politics, we've done philosophy. What's political philosophy? You might think that this is political philosophy. You've got philosophy on one side of your Venn diagram, you've got politics on the other, and you've got political philosophy in the middle. Well, that, that would be to say that politics is just that part of, uh, sorry, political philosophy is just that part of politics that's philosophical, or that part of philosophy that deals with politics. So that's almost right, but it's not quite right. Um, remember, remember what's important about politics and what's important about philosophy. What's important about politics is its subject matter. Politics deals with power. And what's important about philosophy is its way of thinking. Philosophy is critical, rational, and systematic. So political philosophy is what happens when you apply the methods of philosophy to the subject matter of politics. Political philosophy is what happens when you do politics in a philosophical way. But there's more to be said about the philosophical way of, of doing politics. And I'll tell you a little bit more about um, the methods of political philosophy, how you do political philosophy, and how you examine the exercise of power. And this is the really important bit of the talk, because it tells you why you should care. Um, perhaps I should have put this slide first, actually, because that way you could have decided whether you cared about this or not right at the beginning, and you could have gone to listen about PDF vulnerabilities or something else if you didn't care. Uh, so, so, so why should you care? Well, here's a quote from the political philosopher Robert Nozick. And he's, this is from his work, Anarchy, State, and Utopia. And he's writing about um, the way that he thinks, the way he does political philosophy. And he says, I write in the mode of much contemporary philosophical work in epistemology or metaphysics. There are elaborate arguments, claims rebutted by unlikely counterexamples, surprising theses, puzzles, abstract structural conditions, challenges to find another theory which, which fits a specified range of cases, startling conclusions, and so on. Though this makes for intellectual interest and excitement, I hope, some may feel that the truth about ethics and political philosophy is too serious and important to be obtained by such flashy tools. Nevertheless, it may be that correctness in ethics is, is not found in what we naturally think. So what's Nozick saying here? You'll notice that philosophers tend to go on a bit. He's saying that for the sort of problems that he's interesting, for interesting problems, the answers aren't always obvious. And so in order to find the truth about interesting problems, you have to do it in a way that's not obvious. In order to find the truth about interesting problems, you have to use flashy tools, as he calls them, unusual methods. So the methods of political philosophy are unusual. It's a different way of thinking. It's not the way most people think in everyday life about mundane subjects. So does any of this sound familiar, perhaps? We're using unusual but effective methods that most people aren't familiar with in order to achieve a particular interesting goal. Well, I think that Robert Nozick is a hacker. I think that philosophers work something like penetration testers for ideas. They work around the edges, probe for weaknesses, try to find different ways of looking at the same things that other people don't use until they find a way through the ideas. So the methods of political philosophy are similar in spirit to the methods employed by hackers. Um, political philosophers are hackers, I suppose. So political philosophy as a subject is just hacking, but in the domain of political ideas. And the subject which political philosophy studies happens, remember, everywhere that there are people. So political philosophy is, I suppose, a form of hacking that can be done anywhere that there are people. So wh why does this apply to the internet in particular? Politics happens wherever people are, and there are people on the internet. So you might think, you know, politics happens on the internet. Well, well yes, that's obvious. But why is the internet of particular interest? Well, I'm not going to talk about things like virtual communities, like those that exist in um, Mamorpagas, or like EVE Online, or World of Warcraft, or Farmville, or whatever. I'm not going to talk about those, because those are designed to resemble the, the real world intentionally. 
So you have avatars representing people, you have money, you have trade, you have guilds and so on, things that are similar to the real world. And the interactions there may be interesting, but they're not interesting enough because they resemble interactions in the real world much too much. Um, I'm going to talk about the communities that arise spontaneously on the internet. Those communities that are, that are organic, that are, are defined by being on the internet and are not necessarily created, brought together. And these sort of communities are interesting in part because the internet is like the real world. People interact on it and obviously people exercise power on the internet. But the internet is also unlike the real world. So people, there are differences in the way that people act. For example, the potential number of people that you come into contact with on the internet can be much greater. And communication on the internet tends to transcend geographical boundaries, and it can be instant, and it can be anonymous, and it can be global. But perhaps the most important difference between the internet and the real world is that you don't spend all your life on the internet. Well, some of you do, I'm sure, but uh, w what I mean is that what happens on the internet often doesn't have the power to affect your real life, or what happens on one corner of the internet doesn't have the power to affect what happens on another corner of the internet, but to the same person. So a real-world citizen normally belongs to one political community, and everything they do, all their interactions, um, can sooner or later be related back to them via their country, via their government. But an internet citizen, or a netizen, I suppose, can, can have different facets of their personality belonging to different communities at the same time. And each of these communities can have different rules, and what happens in one doesn't affect the other. It's very easy to separate them. So what happens on the internet also stays on the internet. So if, if you leave, for example, comments on Justin Bieber's MySpace page, that probably won't affect the patch that you submit to the Linux kernel. Um, unless Linus is not a fan of uh, Justin Bieber, I, I don't know. Um, so the most important difference is that your offline and online presences can be separated, and your online presence can be you know, put into different boxes, segregated bits from each other. So what happens on the internet stays on the internet. Um, OK, so that's the, the introductory part, I suppose. So that now that the actual analysis -y bit. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is freedom. Uh, or, or liberty, or liberty or freedom, and uh, it's one of the most basic concepts in political philosophy. So remember, politics is about power, but what happens when there isn't any power? Well, you're free. Essentially, you're free or you have liberty as long as nobody has power over you, nobody can tell you what to do. It's a controversial definition for some people, but we'll forget that for the time being. Um, so. And I'm going to look at liberty in the context of a certain type of internet community. Uh, so the FLOSS community, or communities, I suppose. So uh, I'm sure you all know that FLOSS stands for Free Libre Open Source Software. Um, and within the FLOSS community, or movement, or whatever, different groups of people collaborate to produce software to meet their different needs, and there are all sorts of different ways of organizing projects. Some of them are academic, some of them are military, some of them are, uh, are commercial, and some of them are hobbyists. Um, so defining freedom within the context of political philosophy is, despite what I said, is actually a little bit difficult. And you think that freedom in floss communities would be easy to define, because it's got free in the name, right? So, no, I mean, there's a reason that you have to refer to floss communities as floss communities, because you have to include free, and you have to include libre, and you have to include open source so that you can uh, cover everyone's way of defining themselves. So, but, but the, first, the, re so the reason that they use this long acronym, part of the reason, is that the word free in, in English has different meanings. So I'm sure you all know this, free is in speech versus free is in beer. Uh, free is in beer being that something doesn't cost anything, and free as a speech being referring to freedom, liberty, that sort of free. So that, that can be confusing, but that's not really the point. Um, I, I'm not talking about free as a beer, and it's pretty, it's pretty easy to avoid uh, that meaning of, of the word. So um, it's only free as a speech that's relevant here. 
These, these are what we would call two different conceptions, sorry, two different concepts of, of freedom. They're two entirely, well, almost entirely separate um, concepts. And, but separating these isn't really the problem. The problem is that even if you accept, even if you know you're just talking about freedom and speech, there are still different conceptions of freedom. Each group working on a different software project is organized slightly differently, and because the main point of the community is to develop the software, the terms under which they contribute to the software and make it available sort of define them. Um, in fact, for FLOSS projects, the license under which they release the code and contribute to the code is something like the constitution of their community. Um, the, so the license is like the constitution. And different groups choose different licenses, so they have different constitutions, so they have different fundamental documents which say what freedoms they have. So because they have different constitutions, they have different understandings of what freedom actually is. So in the real world, there are many different types of constitution. I don't know where you all live, but I imagine you all live in uh, democracies or republics or something like that. Even within you know, relatively democratic states, there are different constitutions, but uh, there are also totalitarian constitutions or communist constitutions, or I don't know if there are anarchist constitutions. I, I, there probably aren't, because I imagine anarchists don't go in for that sort of thing. Um, but so there are different... In the real world, there are lots of different types of constitution. But within the FLOSS community movement, um, there are only really two different types of constitution, or two, two large groups of constitution. So there are two main styles. Um, that's interesting. Ah, oh, there we go. Um, BSD versus GPL styles. And I'm sure you're all familiar with this debate. Uh, people trying to decide what license they should actually use for their software. But in case you're not, here's a summary. So the BSD license. Um, it's, the BSD license is an example of the permissive family of software licenses. Under it, you can do more or less pretty much anything um, when you're redistributing the code, except you have to include the, the license and the copyright clause uh, broadly. And things like, so it looks something like this, uh, when there's more text than this, but essentially that's pretty much all you have to do. Um, the GPL, on the other hand, is a restrictive software license. So there are a lot more restrictions, things you can't do with the code that you receive under the GPL. And to give you an idea, this isn't the license itself, it's a description of the license, um, but the GPL is supposed to guarantee these four freedoms, uh, which, which are set out in the license and enforced with, with various restrictions. So the main difference between the GPL style and the BSD style licenses is the presence or not of copyleft. Copyleft is a general method for making a program or other work free and requiring all modified and extended versions of the program to be free as well. So the BSD, doesn't in, BSD license doesn't include a copyleft clause, GPL does. So copyleft is actually quite similar to a concept from political philosophy. Um, the, the American political philosopher John Rawls came up with this thing called the first principle of liberty. So what, he's trying, what Rawls is trying to do is he's trying to uh, say how states should be organized, and he's an American, so he says everything should be organized like America, except we'll do things slightly better. So he comes up with this idealized version of American uh, liberalism. And what he says is that first, before, before anything else, when you're talking about justice in the state, each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive scheme of equal liberties compatible with a similar scheme of liberties for others. So in other words, you're free to do anything that doesn't make anyone else less free. Rules piles on other conditions on top of this afterwards, which people don't like, but you can see there's at least somewhat of a parallel between these two. So, a copyleft pro provision like that in the GPL restricts the use of the software in a very specific way. What copyleft does 
is it prevents anything that's derived from the copylefted software from being made available in a way that's not free. Or the copyleft removes your right to, your freedom to make things unfree. And because, as I said, members of FLOSS communities interact pretty much solely because of the software, or, or at least mainly because of the software, saying something about the software is, in, is equivalent to saying something about the whole community. So a FLOSS constitution considers people insofar as they contribute to the code, because it's a license for the code. So a restriction on what you do as a code is pretty much the only sort of restriction that that sort of community can impose on you. So if software is released under the BSD license without the copyleft clause, you can do what, pretty much what you like, and under the GPL, you can't. And so, so copyleft, um, a, lo a lot of people like it as a concept, and there are, there, you know, there are different reasons for using it. There are economic reasons, there are ethical reasons, there are technological reasons uh, for using copyleft. But I'm interested um, in a political reason. So the question I'm going to ask, ask about these FLOSS communities is, does releasing software under the GPL create less freedom than releasing software under the BSD? Or in other words, is copyleft less free? So I'm almost all of you will probably already know what you think about this matter. Um, but so it seems probably to some people like it's an obvious, an, an obvious answer to the question but I, I'm going to try to answer it anyway. So the first thing you have to do in order to answer the question about whether copyleft is less free is to define what you mean by freedom. Now, earlier on, I sort of glossed over that. I didn't say what I thought freedom was or what other people thought freedom was because it's a difficult subject. But now that we've got a specific example in mind, um, let's have another attempt at it. So this is one way of thinking about freedom. And this was proposed by the political philosopher Hillel Steiner. I'm not sure if he was the first, but he definitely talked about it. And what he says is that freedom is proportional to the things that you can do. So suppose I'm standing alone on this stage. There are a number of things I can do. I can pace up and down. Uh, I can walk over this way. I can go and bang my head against the wall. Um, there's a number of things I can do. But Imagine I, I find this mouse. Now I've got the mouse, I can uh, take it apart, take the battery out, I can throw it into the audience. There's a certain number of more things I can do. So when I have the mouse, there's more things I can do, so I'm more free. So it seems to stand to reason that if there are less things I can do, I become less free. And I think you might already see how this applies to copyleft. Let's think about the number of things I can do with BSD licensed software against the number of things I can do with GPL copylefted software. So here's the BSD license on the left, on the right, sorry, and here's the GPL, and here's the GPL, and here's the GPL, and here's the GPL, and it continues. Uh, so the obvious thing you can see, not without, without even reading the licenses, is that uh, one is significantly longer than the other, and it contains more restrictions and notably copyleft. So it seems like um, in the case where there are more restrictions under the GPL, you're less free. I mean, imagine if there was a license that prevented you from using your, the software for military use or uh, using it for commercial use. It'd be pretty, much uncon pretty uncontroversial that that software is less free. So you might think that a similar line of reasoning applies to the GPL. Um, if the software is copylefted, there are some things you can't do with it, so it's less free. Copyleft is, is still a restriction on what you can do, despite, despite the aims of the policy. Uh, I mean, it's, it, if you just think about it under a non-copyleft license, that you can do all the same things as under a copyleft license, except more. So more things you can do under non-copyleft, without copyleft, so copyleft makes you, whoops, less free. There are more restrictions, less freedom. So that's one obvious answer. But as it turns out, that answer's wrong. 
Why is the answer wrong? Um, it's wrong because it's vague. And, and this kind of thing happens all the time in philosophy. You think you understand something because you've got a pretty good idea of how you use a word in everyday life, and then you're talking to someone and you have a disagreement. And then you realize later on that the reason you've disagreed is that you didn't define all of your terms. Uh, so when we're talking about freedom or anything else really, you have to define all your terms at the beginning and if you come to a disagreement, one of the first things you have to consider is that the other person, you're talking across each other and the other person doesn't share the definition with you. Um, so what's the problem in this case? Well, uh, here's the definition of freedom that I presented earlier. Freedom is proportional to the things you can do. Well, we have a term here, u, and that looks like it's a constant in this definition, but actually u is a variable. <laughs> so because the definition doesn't say who u applies to, different people look at this definition and they think it means different things. In the BSD license, as it turns out, u applies to one group of people, and in GPL, uh, u applies to another group of people. So and if, if there's no agreement on this, um, if people don't say with respect to whom we're defining freedom, then we're just talking across each other. Now, I mean, you know, political philosophers have been around for a long time. We've come across this problem before. Um, and here's what Jared McCallum, another political philosopher, had to say about this problem. So McCallum said, in order to define freedom, in order to talk about freedom in an interesting, in a relevant way, you have to say three things. You have to express your definition in the form X is free from Y to do Z, where X ranges over agents, Y ranges over preventing conditions, and Z ranges over actions. So, this is referred to as the tripartite definition of freedom, or tripartite freedom. Um, as it turns out, the BSC and the GPL pretty much agree on what Y and Z are. In general, the conditions that you want to be free from are the things that are imposed by default, by normal copyright laws, copyright laws, um, and the freedom, the, the sort of freedoms you want to have, the actions you want to be able to do, are things like using and distributing and modifying the software. But what they don't agree on is X. They don't agree on who the agent is. The GPL and the BSD disagree on who the subject of freedom is, who, um, to whom freedom applies. Under the BSD, uh, which says something like this, freedom is for redistributors. And under the GPL, which says something like this, freedom is for all users. So, so in this case, what does copyleft do to freedom? Now we've realized that we have slightly different definitions. Well, it seems like it's something like this. Redistributors look like they're a subset of all users. So it seems like the GPL which is concerned with the freedom of all users is better, guarantees more freedom, because you're guaranteeing freedom for a larger group of people. So we're being less selfish, I suppose, if we're trying to get freedom for as many people as possible. If we're trying to get freedom for all users under the GPL versus just redistributors under the BSD. So the first time round, we thought the copyleft made us less free, but now it seems that copyleft makes us more free because there's more freedom for more people. As it turns out, this answer is wrong as well. Uh, due to, well we haven't, still haven't thought about it enough, still haven't talked about it enough. Um, why, why, is this, why is this answer wrong? Well, political philosophy has been here before as well. Um, and this time, it's in the work of a man named Isaiah Berlin, who talked about, in a famous paper, talked about, amongst other things, uh, there being different types of freedom. And Berlin says that 
There are two, concept, two conceptions of freedom that are different and irreconcilable. They're, they're entirely separate. They, don't, they, don't, they mean so, things that are so diverse that you can't bring them into agreement. He says there are ty two types of freedom, then positive and negative freedom. And the way that he defines them, positive freedom is a sort of freedom that applies to groups, like all users or the community. And negative freedom uh, is a sort of freedom that applies to individuals. So why does this matter? Well, the crucial difference between the GPL and the BSD is that under the BSD, the term redistributors um, applies to individuals considered individually. But under the GPL, all users is a collective group. So um, under the BSD, we care about the freedom of you and the freedom of you and the freedom of you and the freedom of you. But under the GPL, we care about the freedom of all of you taken together. And in this case, because the way that we conceptualize the group, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And here's the problem. The GPL uses positive freedom. Copyleft is positive freedom. The GPL cares about the freedom of groups. Copyleft cares about the freedom of groups. So, so far, you've only got my word for it that this is actually a problem. I haven't said anything about what negative and positive freedom actually are. Um, I haven't told you why you should prefer one over the other. You might be thinking, but I like groups. I like living in a group. So perhaps I would prefer the freedom of groups to the freedom of individuals. Um, well, Berlin disagrees with you. And to show you why positive freedom, the freedom of groups, is a problem, I've come up with an example of another software license. And, and this is one that luckily doesn't actually exist. This is a general slavery license. Under the GSL, each user is required to contribute 4,000 lines of code or 500 man hours, whichever is the greatest, to maintaining, updating, or improving the software. Obviously, the license is a lot longer than this, but that's just an extract. Um, so it's a ridiculous idea, of course, right? Yeah. Uh, but still, let's, let's go with the thought experiment. Let's think about what the consequences for freedom are of having this license. Um, so such a license would actually make your software much better, if you think about it, because everyone who uses it is forced to contribute in some way. And because the software is better, there are more things you can do with it. And because there are more things you can do with it, you're more free. So forcing all your users into slavery would actually make them more free. I, um, I'm not sure it would be adopted by the OSI, though. So the general slavery license actually increases the freedom of the group, of the community of users of the software. The GSL improves positive freedom. It makes the group more free. But obviously, this doesn't benefit any particular individual. Individuals under this are made less free. So negative freedom is impacted negatively, is decreased by the GSL. So because we've got these two different conceptions, well, almost conceptions of freedom, we've got different things happening to freedom at the same time. Now, this is an extreme example, of course, but in terms, in, in political philosophy terms, the, in thought experiment terms, the only difference between this and the GPL is the nature of the restriction imposed. There's still a restriction under the GPL. It's just less extreme. In, instead of forced labor, you've got um, sort of prevention from doing specific things. The, the GPL and the GSL are different, of different amplitude, but they're the same type of idea. And this comes about because positive freedom doesn't care about the extent of restrictions. In fact, positive freedom doesn't care about how much freedom there is. Positive freedom only cares about where the restrictions come from. 
So to be positively free, you have to do, the, um, to be positively free, the restrictions have to come from the group or the community, not from someone outside. If the restrictions are to a certain extent self-imposed, by, by the group at least, then that makes you more free, regardless of how much stuff you can actually do. So positive freedom goes against negative freedom. They're diametrically opposed. I, 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 this probably still hasn't made the case for some of you. I imagine, I mean, I'd, I'd like to have my code um, up, updated and improved forcibly by, by everyone who uses it. But th this, this, this is some, still something to worry about, and it's something that Berlin worried about. In fact, Isaiah Berlin had um, two arguments against positive freedom. So this, is, this touches on the first argument. What he said was, um, positive freedom, the problem with positive freedom, the freedom of groups, is that it can lead to things like the general slavery license. And the way he put it was, um, the rationalist argument has led by steps which, if not logically valid, are historically and psychologically intelligible. From an ethical doctrine of individual responsibility and individual self-perfection to an authoritarian state obedient to the directives of an elite of platonic guardians. In other words, positive freedom isn't really freedom at all. It's just tyranny by another name. So you might get to choose your tyrant, but I, I, I don't think anyone really thinks, at least Berlin didn't think that anyone really thinks, that a group is made more free just because their leader or the, the conditions that are imposed upon them if they don't have a leader are, come from within the group. You can't make a group of people more free by forcing them to do the right thing. So. Berlin's second argument against positive freedom is um, less, no, it's more convincing, I think. I think it's, it's, it's a better argument because people, ob people obviously do adhere to positive freedom. But, it, it, so this one doesn't put positive freedom in opposition with negative freedom. It just says on its own terms why negative freedom is better. So, if we were using positive freedom, every person who we were thinking about would be able to claim that certain types of restrictions should be imposed for the benefit of the group. Different people have got different aims, so they'd ask for different restrictions. Uh, so academics would ask for educational restrictions which benefit education, uh, companies was ask, would ask for commercial benefits, and the military would ask for defense benefits. But not all of these goals are compatible because different people not only want different things, but they want things that can't all be granted at the same time. So positive freedom can't work if in your group different people have got different goals. If in a group everyone thinks the same way, then positive freedom can work, but as it turns out, uh, that's not very often the case. So. Berlin suggests that rather than imposing all these different individual restrictions to get everyone what they want, in order, rather than choosing positive freedom with lots of different goals and lots of different restrictions, what we should do is say, well, everyone has negative freedom, and choose your own goals, and then you can work towards them. And if you can convince people to work with you, fine, but we're not going to let you impose restrictions because that's counterproductive and it wouldn't work anyway. The way Berlin puts it is he says that there's no a priori reason to believe that there is a final solution in which all positive values are important. The ends of men may not be reconcilable, so freedom to choose through pluralism of values, and hence negative freedom, is the truer ideal. So positive freedom, and the second argument is essentially Positive freedom works, yes, but it only works for authoritarian groups where there's a single goal. So here's, here's the third take on, on copyleft. Um, freedom can only acceptably be defined as a property of individuals, not a property of groups. If you define freedom as a property of groups, 
if you use positive freedom, then you're using a conception of freedom that's dangerous and misleading. So if you're using copyleft, the way you think about freedom is dangerous and misleading. So here's the too long didn't listen uh, version of the talk. Copyleft reduces freedom unless you misdefine freedom. And positive freedom, this misdefinition of freedom, is harmful to real freedom, to negative freedom. So copyleft really does reduce freedom. Now, I, I've, so essentially, this is what it boils down to uh, through all the talking and the quotes and so on. But in floss groups, not everyone chooses uh, permissive licenses. Not all software is licensed under the BSD. So does that mean that everyone who uses, an, who uses a copyleft license is some sort of authoritarian dictator? Well, no, it doesn't. Um, as it turns out, as far as real-world FLOSS projects are concerned, nothing I just said matters. So why does... So, sorry, guys, you can, can all leave now. It's, uh, it doesn't... It doesn't <laughs> there's no point in what I just said. Why, why is this? Well, because I've been talking philosophy and I've been trying to talk about the real world at the same time and the two don't mix. No. Uh, the real reason is that software freedom isn't just about freedom. Software freedom is actually about other things, like equality and fairness and goodness to a certain extent. And so software freedom isn't just about freedom. And talking about FLOSS projects as if they just care about freedom is confusing matters. They have freedom in the name, but that's not all that matters to them. If you think they just care about freedom, then you think they're all authoritarian dictators. But Really, there are a lot of other values that we care about as well. Freedom might be first for some of us, for all of us, I don't know. Freedom might be the first thing you care about, but you also care about giving something back, about everyone being equal on the same level, about actually producing usable software, maybe, sometimes. Um, so we have to be clear, again, what we actually care about so we can actually have a discussion. Freedom means a very specific thing. And if we include equality and goodness and happiness and pink unicorns and whatever, if we include all that in freedom, then we get misled and we think that certain things are freedom that aren't actually freedom, and then we disagree. So we have to be clear about what it is that is freedom and what isn't freedom. And regardless of whether something's good, we think something's good, that doesn't mean it benefits freedom. It can be good without benefiting freedom. Yeah, so I think this conclusion and the argument that's led to it can qualify as reaching the truth by unconventional means. I mean, it, it was a little bit circuitous. And we've discovered using the tools of political philosophy something that's not obvious at first glance about something that actually matters. Um, and we've talked about politics and philosophy and power and constitutions and freedom and Rawls's first principle and McCallum's tripartite definition, and we found out that everything isn't as it seems. So, despite what some people might think, politics isn't just intruding into the internet. Politics has always been there. And you can't escape politics, whether you're deciding how to license your code or how to organize your community or how to do anything else that involves other people. But if you think about these political concepts in the right way, and maybe if you draw inspiration from the work of previous philosophers, you'll be able to make a decision that's at least thoughtful and that you can communicate to other people. The answers to these sort of questions aren't always easy, but I hope you'll find that the questions are at least interesting. Thank you.
Thank you. So we're going to uh, take questions now. So uh, if you only have... easy questions, no difficult questions, please. <laughs> so if you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll come to you with the mic. No flame wars either. Yes, hello. Uh, there's a question from IRC, oh dear. Um, and the question is, did you ever look into other software licenses, as example, Microsoft Windows license? Sorry, um, I, can't, I can't actually understand what you're saying. Did you ever look into other software licenses, as an example, for example, Microsoft Windows license? Did I ever look into other software licenses, as an example, for example, the Microsoft Windows license? No, I, I did talk about totalitarian dictatorships, right? Yeah, that's... <laughs> That's what that's about. Um, no, and I suppose, you know, I, there were two ways I could take this talk. I could either say, yeah, I'm going to talk about the whole of philosophy, and I introduce and analyze and discuss a concept in 15 seconds, and that way I can cover the whole thing, or I could focus really down and try to lead you through one specific argument. Um, there's certainly something to be said about the specific uh, restrictions that are imposed in, in, in other licenses. And I have thought about it, but there wasn't really space for it in this talk. But uh, is my email address on here? If, if, if you have an idea, okay, my email address is on my website anyway. So if you have an idea about that, I think it's on Pentabuff as well. So if you, if you have an idea about uh, what happens to freedom in Windows, <laughs> what happens to freedom in Windows, then, then do feel free to, to get in touch. Thank you. Uh, hello, just a little remark. Uh, while we're you were presenting uh, the, the positive and the negative freedoms. I was thinking that, in fact, the GPL could be seen as a negative freedom, like you could compare them to the negative freedoms of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the right of each individual not to be. And I was thinking about the right of each user not to be dispossessed by anyone else of the right to use and to give yeah. As, the, as, as you received the same product. Okay, so, so you, could, you could think about the GPL. Um, under, so obviously this is simplified because we could argue about this forever. Um, but you, so you could talk about the GPL through the lens of negative freedom. And here's the problem. This is a problem from another domain of, of philosophy. This is a problem from ethics. So some people, utilitarians, they think that in order to be a good person, you always have to maximize happiness. Everything you do, maximize happiness, maximize happiness, maximize happiness. Any action you take, that's what makes it the right thing to do. So you might want to say the GPL does the same thing, except instead of maximizing happiness, whatever you do, maximize freedom, maximize freedom, maximize freedom. Here's the problem. Um, the world is really big, and it's very hard to tell what the consequences of your action are going to be tomorrow or five years down the line or ten years down the line. So it's very hard to tell uh, how to maximize happiness or how to maximize freedom. If, if, it, it certainly um, looks like a good principle, but it's very hard to actually guide your actions with it. You don't think so? You think it's easy to... Okay, go on. No, I, I was thinking more about the fact that it, as a negative freedom, the freedom to prevent every other user, including the still unborn ones, of the risk of being dispossessed of the freedom to, to access the same okay, knowledge. In, yeah, including, that, so, including um, so thinking about the future, including, um, including the users who aren't yet born in your calculation of how free it is. So you've got the, the freedom, you know, however you measure freedom, you've got your level of freedom, and then you look at all, everyone who's ever going to use a software throughout history, and you try to assess what you do to maximize that level of freedom. Okay, um, well, what you could do is you could put in your software license a clause that says everybody who uses the software license must have six children. That way you've got a huge number of, and they must all use the software. That way you've got a huge number of future users of the software, and regardless of how much freedom they have, if you make sure there are enough people, there's a lot of freedom. So you can't, so uh, that's what, that would be one way of maximizing freedom. I know, I know what you're saying. I know, I know why you're saying it, but I don't know if you could actually, I don't know if you could actually think that way in practice to guide your actions. 
we'll go, on, go on again. Yes. Okay, um, this is possibly uh, an attempt to break your prohibition on difficult questions and indeed on flame wars, <laughs> but I'll try it anyway. Um, I'd like to accuse you of a certain intellectual dishonesty in relying on an opponent of positive freedom for your definition of it. That is to say, I don't think it's appropriate to use Berlin to define positive freedom. But then to your thesis that you've used political philosophy to say something that matters, I'd like to suggest that you've actually done the opposite. You've reduced the concept of freedom by virtue of the fact that you've said that um, freedom is not necessarily desirable and not the only thing that's desirable, that you've reduced freedom to something that no longer matters at all. So, two questions for you then. How would you define positive freedom? And do you think that freedom is the only thing that matters? Uh, to the second question, that depends on the definition of freedom that one okay, would Okay, but accept. if you define freedom in the way that you want, would it be the only thing that matters? In the way that who wants? That you want. Um, why do I wish to? Um, personally, I'd say that freedom isn't something that should be analysed in terms of what exists in the real world, um, and that it's a mistake that's often made by philosophers to assume that we can talk about freedom as a tangible, or not necessarily tangible, but as a property of the empirical world rather than a property of conceptual thought, something that limits but also enables the way in which we can think. So, um, to to name the philosophers there that are developing that thought. It's an Adornian conception of freedom as an emphatic concept or, in a sense, a Kantian regulative idea, rather than a concept that actually applies to the world. So what is your definition of freedom, then? That, what is that definition of freedom? That definition would be freedom as an aspiration to a a fulfilled and complete life for everybody. Freedom as a fulfilled and complete life to everybody. No, as an aspiration to oh, as an aspiration fulfilled to. and complete life for everybody. Okay, so freedom is a thing that, that, that doesn't actually exist in the real world and can't, but it's something you want to work towards. Absolutely. Is that right? Okay, so... That's, that's certainly a valid way of looking at freedom. The, the, the way I was, I, was, I was approaching this is coming at political philosophy via ethics. And under, under at least my preferred version of my preferred you know, selected ethical theories, the ethical theory you choose has to be action guiding. So anything that, anything that you want to become true has to be specific enough that you can actually work towards it. Now, I, I'm not sure if, do, do you think that freedom as a Kantian ideal is actually something that you can, as an individual, work towards? Yes, yeah, sorry. Oh, no mic, right. No, so it's, so it's not something, so as an individual, you can't actually work towards it. But I don't endorse the Kantian ideal, I endorse the Adornian concept that could be seen as a sort of Kantian ideal. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Right, but is, nevertheless, is it something that as an individual you can work towards? Sorry. Come on the stage, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps this is a conversation we should have a coffee afterwards. Yes. Um, uh, as an individual, yes, but not only. Okay, so as an individual, okay, so we're... So here's the uh, sort of meta, meta, meta question that we're considering here. We're trying to get very different things out of political philosophy. Um, I'm trying to consider it as a practical exercise, as something that actually tells you how to structure the world. Now, if you disagree with that as a very project, then we're not going to agree on the conclusions we come to about the terms we're talking about. No, my point is you didn't because you redefine freedom towards the end as something that's neither necessarily desirable or the only thing that's desirable, which means it no longer tells us anything about how to structure the world. I didn't say it wasn't necessarily desirable. I think freedom is, is desirable, but I don't think it's the only thing that's desirable. Sorry, then, I misunderstood. Okay. <laughs> we only have a, a couple more minutes left. Yes, one more question from RSC. Um, a negative freedom like BSD, wouldn't you say it is restrictive to others to say that others cannot use a new feature 
which is implemented in the software. So is it tyranny of an individual and not of a group? So, uh, yeah, I, I, is, is negative freedom to, is tyranny of the individual, not of the group? Is that right? Yes. Um, okay, so this is, again, getting into how you would actually go about implementing negative freedom. So the problems with positive freedom are sort of uh, theoretical. And the, positive, the problems with negative freedom actually seem to be more practical. It's very difficult to define what the scope of freedom is so that it can, it can apply to each individual without impinging on everyone else. Uh, I, I accept that that's a problem. And I'm not sure how within, within the, any sort of political community um, you would define it in an appropriate way so that one person's freedoms don't cover up everyone else's. It's what, what Rawls says, and it's probably Rawls' fault, uh, not mine. What Rawls says about having this, this scope of, of freedoms that are compatible with the same scope for everyone else is extremely difficult to, to understand, really, how you measure the scope of someone's freedom and how you make them equal. So while certainly uh, that's a good point, yes. Okay, so we only have one time for one last question. Sorry that we don't have more time. It's a very engaging discussion, but uh, here's the last question. Do you think, do you think there's an essential difference if the restriction is uh, um, you have to do, like in your slavery uh, license, or in the advertisement clause of the original BSD, or it is um, a special you mustn't, like in the GPL. So is, is the essential difference whether the restriction is you have to do something or you have to not do something? Um, the, I think the only way of telling whether... So an action's an action, right? So uh, if I step over here, that can be considered as I moved over there or it could be considered as I didn't stay here. Now we're more inclined naturally to think of that as I moved over there because the natural state for me is to remain here. So in order to determine what is an action and what is an inaction, you need to have a sort of natural state. Yeah, so I... That you mustn't kill your neighbor. I think it's another thing like you have to do uh, uh, 20 hours uh, uh, common work uh, a week. You see what I mean? Yes, I do. And, you know, in most, in most everyday scenarios, the, the sort of uh, the, the resting place, the natural, the natural condition is easy to determine. But um, there's a paper by Hillel Steiner called, I think it's on threats and offers, something like that where he's talking in a slightly different context, and he makes what I think is a convincing case for, so for at least on a philosophical level, saying it's very difficult to determine where the natural resting level is. Now, you can probably apply it in everyday life without a problem, um, but if you're, try, if you're trying to start from the most, you know, the most uh, abstract level and work your way down, it can be a bit tricky. I can't prove that to you now, but I'll try and give you the reference to the paper if you're interested. Thank you. All right, well, let's give the speaker another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.